Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a privilege to be here. Um, today, let's keep things informal. If you have any questions, out with it. Uh, don't wait till the end. Uh, just stick your hand up, or if you're online, uh, just raise your hand online. Um, call me Harold, and uh, let's get going. So as you can see, um, it's just a matter of floating your idea, and they give you money. And I'll go home. Actually, uh, there we go. Okay. Actually, it's not so simple. In fact, it's a very difficult process. And if you ask any founder or any CEO about raising money, they'll tell you not to underestimate the difficulty. The bottom line is this. If you're a founder, your job is to raise money. You may not think of yourself that way. You may think of yourself as a scientist or an engineer or a physician, but you've taken on the role of founder or you've taken on the role of CEO, your job is now to raise money. It's your job, so take it seriously and do it well. It takes a lot of effort. Most CEOs I know spend 50% of their time, at least, raising money. In fact, um, as one founder put it to me, said, I spend 90% of my time raising money, and I spend my other 90% of the time running my business. That's just how it goes. So if you're gonna do this, accept it that this is your job. And this is kind of a summary of the talk. You have to, you have to be like a duck, calm on top and paddling like crazy on the bottom. Um, on the top, you are displaying vision and confidence and passion about what you're trying to raise money for. But on the bottom, you're doing research, you're doing validation, and you're practicing, practicing, practicing. Okay, so some basics. There are three pitches you have to have as a founder at your disposal. An elevator pitch, which is the length of time it takes to go up in the elevator. Um, 30 seconds to two minutes. You can see here what I'm advising you to put it in your elevator pitch. The goal is what's important. The goal of your elevator pitch is to make the investor want to hear more. Okay, the short pitch which is done for most, most pitch contests. Most pitch contests give you 10 minutes. So you have to have a short pitch available. You also might get an investor who says, I'll give you 10 minutes. Have that available. And then the long pitch, um, when they really invite you to come in and spend an hour with them, your pitch should never be more than 20 minutes. Okay, the goal of the long pitch is to get the investor to proceed to due diligence. Due diligence comes from basic legislation that says that investors must be duly diligent in making investments when they're investing other people's money. So that's where the term due diligence comes from. Um, you'll notice that none of these goals are to get an investment. Nobody's gonna write you a check on the basis of a pitch. Okay, the goal is to get to due diligence. What does that mean for you? It means you don't have to say everything in your pitch. You keep your pitch simple. The idea is make them want to hear more. Okay, you have to have enough in there to make them want to hear more, but you don't have to have spreadsheet after spreadsheet with financials, etc. That comes during due diligence. Okay, everybody get that? Okay. Second basic, what an awful lot of founders forget to do, is you do your research on the investors. It's vitally important, really, for two reasons. One is, you have to decide whether it's worth your time to meet with them. If there's an investor that only writes checks bigger than $10 million, and there's lots of them, and you're a founder in a startup, it's useless for you to meet with them, right? So you find out what industries do they invest in. If they don't invest in your industry, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're spending your time educating them and you're not gonna get anywhere. 
Uh, what geographic locations do they invest in? A lot of U.S. investors won't invest in Canada. If you're in the States and you're at a conference and there's investor meetings, find out which ones will invest in Canada, have invested Canada in the past. This just makes sense, right? Um, you also want to find out what their interests are. What other companies are they invested in? so that you can see if there's any synergy between what you're offering and what they've already invested in so that they can kind of leverage the knowledge they've gained in these other industries towards helping you. Okay, so research the investors. I said that there were two reasons. The second reason is that the wrong investor can ruin a company. I've seen this happen over and over again. There are some investors who you just don't want to work with. Do your research on them. Find out who else they've invested in. Call the CEO of a company they've invested in. How are they to work with? Do they micromanage you? All those questions and make sure that, you know, things mesh because bringing on an investor is a little bit like getting married. Okay. Yes, they're going to choose you and you're desperate for money doesn't mean you should take anybody. You have to be a little selective as well. So bottom line here is find the right investor, structure your pitch from the investor's perspective. What does the investor want? What is their mission? You know, every investor group has a website and on it, it says our mission is to do the following. Try and structure your, your pitch towards that. So your pitch can be different for each investor. That's okay. The next basic. Some of you may have seen this movie. Great movie. Um, show me the money means you have to think and talk money. We all start out as founders with something that we think is going to save the world, right? It's going to, going to help cure a disease that help ease suffering. We all want to do good in this world. But your job as founder and CEO is to convince people that you can handle their money and that you're going to spend it well, they're going to use it well, and that you're going to give them a return on that investment. And all the investors that you talk to are fundamentally good at money. That's what they do for a living. So. You need to think money. If the investor asks you, what do you think your sales are gonna be two years from now? And you say, oh, let me look at my notes. You're done. Okay, you need to have all those figures right at your fingertips. Okay, really important. A lot of people in the medical profession kind of have this impression that money is, is crass, it's commercial, it's beneath them. We're here to do wonderful work. Well, the reality of the situation is you need money to do wonderful work. So think money, talk money, okay? Get yourself educated in basic accounting and basic finance before you go talk to investors because they're gonna ask you questions to determine how comfortable you are managing money. Okay, so um, those are the basics. Now we're gonna get into style and substance. Okay, you all know that there are people who are great at style and there are people who are great at substance. To do a pitch, you need both. So we're gonna talk about both of them. So first of all, for style, as I said before, you have to convey confidence, vision, and passion. Okay. What I've told you is that venture capitalists and other investors are concerned about money. It's true, but they're also, I mean, they're human beings. They want to do good. A lot of investors I know are, are really proud of what they have brought to the market in terms of easing suffering and addressing diseases and stuff like that. Um, and they do respond to passion. They're human beings. 
So display that passion that you have about your product or your service. Um, keep your slide deck short. Even for a long pitch, 15 to 20 slides, absolute top. Um, you don't want to get into too much detail. You want to keep your sides simple, large fonts, lots of pictures. You want to be transparent and honest with the investor. If you don't know an answer, say you don't know an answer. Um, ask for and accept feedback. Very important. Learn from every pitch you do so that the next one you're better. Okay. Um, bottom line from this, you all know if you're a good speaker or not. If you're not a good speaker, get a coach, become a good speaker. It's your job, okay? It's really important. You need to be able to speak, as I said, slowly, clearly, loudly, and passionately, okay? And, and that's what works. So let's talk about substance, okay? You need the style, but you need substance. You, a strong business case, gives you a strong pitch. It's an absolute, there is just nobody who will argue with this. You have to have a strong business case. Okay, what is a business case? A business case is, this, is the justification for your business. Why should my business exist? And why should people invest money in that business? Okay, it sounds very simple. It's not your business plan. Your business plan is, you know, 50 pages of all kinds of facts and figures. Your business case is why should my business exist? And we're gonna talk about what's in there. Why do you need a strong business case? Here's where the sharks come in. Okay, by the way, how to swim with the sharks and not get eaten alive is the name of a real classic business text by Harvey McKay. And if you ever get the chance to read it, it's one of the really good ones. Very practical advice. Anyway, you need a strong business case, obviously, for investors, okay? Investors will listen to your pitch, and if you've done a really good job, they'll go into due diligence and just look in every orifice. I mean, they'll, look, they'll examine everything you've got as thoroughly as they can. Um, if you have a weakness in your business case, you will not, maybe you'll still get an investment, but you won't get the valuation that you think you deserve. If you think that your business is worth $3 million and you go with, and you do your pitch and they're gonna ask you, what do you think your business is worth? And you say it's worth 3 million, they do their due diligence and they come back and they say, well, we'll give you a pre-money valuation of 2 million. Why? Because you've got a hole in your business case. And you'll object to that and then you'll get the standard venture capital uh, lecture that says dilution never killed anybody but lack of cash does so take the dilution they always say that if you have a strong business case you get the valuation you deserve okay and that's why it's worth spending the time and effort developing that business case the other reason to develop the business case is for yourself a lot of people get pushed into starting businesses. The university is spinning out incredible numbers of businesses right now. A lot of those businesses, quite frankly, do not deserve to exist. Okay? The only person who can really tell you that is yourself. So do your business case. Sit down with yourself, be honest, and say, is this a strong enough business case? for me to invest several years of my life into? And ask yourself, okay? Yeah. What are the key data points that you look for that demonstrates, you know, the, that my business case is good? We will go over that. Okay, okay that's coming. If you're not happy with the detail I'm providing, let me know and I'll go into more. Okay. The last real basic that I want to talk to you about is validation. It is relatively easy to write a business case. Okay, you sit down, a couple of days later, 
a business case pops out and you're really proud of it. But the problem is the arguments that you've made, the numbers that you've assumed, you basically picked out of the air. How much am I going to sell two years from now? $5 million. Investors see through that instantly. You have to validate every assumption, every number, every argument that you make in your business case. And it's that process of validation that takes the time and the effort. And we're going to go through that. Um, okay. And you have to do validation really rigorously, just like you've done everything else in your life to get to this point. Okay. And we're going to go over validation, but I wanted to bring this up first because nobody does when they talk about this subject, they talk about what has to be in your pitch, but they don't talk about why, it, even if it's there, it can be very weak. Okay, what determines a really good pitch from a really bad pitch is how well all that stuff is validated. Okay, so most important elements of a business case. To my mind, there are five things. Market potential, is it going to sell? Intellectual property, can you protect it? Financial return, why should I invest in your product? Um, when am I going to get paid back? How much am I going to get paid back? Your ability to execute, which means your ability to actually do what you say you're going to do. And finally, the risks that your business faces. Okay, so these five elements. Now, market potential. You have to come up with a value proposition. You've probably been talked about this ad nauseum. But your value proposition, you need several of them. You need one for physicians, for patients, hospitals, for healthcare systems, for the reimbursement agencies, and you, you might even have a different value proposition for investors. Um, the bottom line, as I say here, is will people be willing to pay for your solution, whatever it is? Okay, um, value propositions should be short and punchy and powerful. If it takes you five minutes to explain your value proposition, you don't have a value proposition, pure and simple. Usually maximum 10 words to say exactly why this is a great thing that you're bringing, that you're developing or bringing to the market, okay? You need a 10 word value proposition because you need an elevator pitch. And if your elevator, if it takes you five minutes to explain your value proposition and you only have 30 seconds for your elevator pitch, it ain't going to happen. Right? Um, I'm chairman of a company called Exact Im Imaging. What's our value proposition? Targeted prostate biopsies with ultrasound. Okay, that may not mean anything to you who are, if you're not in urology, but in urology, you can only do targeted biopsies with MRI. We can do it with ultrasound, okay? And do it better than MRI for that matter. But the point is, it's a very short value proposition and it says what we do and it says why it's important. Okay, market potential. Is this truly disruptive? Is the market receptive? Again, you've probably heard all this stuff before. Also consider competition. Also consider, does it fit into current workflow? Doctors don't like to change their workflow. Doctors are resistant to change. If you can come up with something that fits within the current workflow, it's much more likely to be adopted. Um, can it be reimbursed adequately? You've had a lecture on reimbursement. Take that very seriously. There are, you know, the problem with founders from Canada is that we have a healthcare system that's free. Who cares about reimbursement? 
the hospital can decide, okay, this is part of my global budget, we're gonna do it. But in the United States, it is a whole different world. In the United States, healthcare is a business, like any other business. And all decisions in healthcare in the United States are not made on the basis of, does it, is it better for the patient? It's done on the basis of, will we make money doing this? There's an old saying in the United States that you could cure cancer, but if it's not reimbursed, it'll fail, right? It's not quite that bad, but it's a lot worse than you think it is. So reimbursement is very key. Um, and, you know, aligned with reimbursement, what's the payback period for the customer? My first experience in industry, I designed a product for a company in Oakville, Ontario. It was in audiology and finished it went down to a meeting in Detroit. I had my little corner of the booth where I had my little machine and the doctor walked up and said, uh, uh, what is it? I told him, what does it do? I told him, uh, oh, he says, uh, how many patients will I see a day? Well, can I use this on a day? I called over one of the salesmen. The salesman says, you'll use this on 12 patients a day. The guy says, what's the reimbursement? $14.92. How much does it cost? Told him the cost. He whips out, back then it was called an HP financial analyst calculator. This is a physician, has a financial analyst calculator, calculates his payback period and says, I'll take one. No questions about accuracy. No questions about what good does it do for the patient. It was a financial decision. A lesson I never forgot, okay? so. Market potential has a lot to do with money. Again, keep it in mind. Now, how do you validate market potential and market adoption? This is probably the most important screen I have in this deck. I'm not gonna read it all, but the important thing is that validating your market potential, valued, validating your value proposition is absolutely key and this is where you're going to spend most of your time okay obviously talk to multiple KOLs key opinion leaders okay um, physicians are very opinionated they have a right to be they've had a lot of education they've had a lot of experience they're very opinionated that doesn't mean with it that they agree with each other you can get physicians from the same specialty that are diametrically opposed on any particular question. You need a lot of people. A lot of companies are founded because there's one physician that says, I need this, I want this, this is great. I made that mistake early on in my career. Talk to lots of people. Talk to 10 or 20 key opinion leaders before you decide that you have validated your value proposition. Okay, the other people that you want to talk to are sales professionals, people who sell in this market, or marketing professionals, or distributors, people who actually talk to customers on a daily basis, somebody in your field. How do you find those people? Well, there's all kinds of conferences out there. If you are in interventional cardiology, for example, go to ACC or any of the other you know, TCT, whatever, walk around the exhibit hall, talk to people in the booths, and say, you know, do you think, you know, show me your machine, is there a market for this? You know, you don't have to give them all the details of your machine, and you should have filed at least a provisional patent before you do any of this, so that you're not worried about making a public disclosure or having somebody steal it from you but go around and talk to these people and get their impression of what you're trying to do. And you'll be amazed at what you hear. Sometimes you'll hear, this is fantastic. When you have this on the market, call me, I wanna come work for you. And sometimes you'll hear, nobody will ever buy that for the following reasons. But the important thing is that you're talking to people who talk to customers every day, who sell this stuff, who really know the market. That's how you validate your market potential. Any questions on that? Yeah. 
I think one, one question on that is, let's say you're talking to um, physicians, usually, like usually some physicians will have like vastly different experiences than others yeah. because of where they're located, what part of the city, or maybe they're in a totally different environment. Uh, so how do you kind of distinguish, because like you said, you're gonna get a lot of thumbs up and a lot of thumbs down, but how do you distinguish the like, I guess the actual true, uh, how can I say it? Like, like, like the, 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 the situations where it's actually valid for your for your product okay. versus yes, this very might good. not actually be a probable situation. It just could be just an isolated. Right, no, it's a very, very good city. point. There are academic hospitals, there are community hospitals, there are rural hospitals, there are private clinics, um, there are sole practitioners, um, there are general practitioners, there are specialists. You want to get a cross-section of as many different ones as you can. And, you know, typically for a startup medical device company, you want to deal with the key opinion leaders. These are typically the people in academic hospitals who are doing a lot of publishing. But sometimes you'll come up with a product that's specifically aimed at the rest of the community. Um, you know, sometimes the key opinion leaders don't need your product because they can do it with their eyes closed. Yeah. And the guys in the community are struggling. Um, you know, one of the first products that, that uh, my company came up with was an electronic stethoscope that could slow down the sound of the heart. Why? For pediatrics. Okay? And the pediatric cardiologists, they didn't need it. Medical students all needed. They could. The heart was going so fast they couldn't hear anything. So, when we did our market survey, you know, we talked to a few pediatric cardiologists, and they said, "Well, yeah, it's very nice, but I don't really need it." And all the residents were going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me try." Right. So you have to. You're not going to come up with something that's going to appeal to everybody. You can't make everybody happy. Okay. But find out who you do to do appeal to. It's a sub-segment of the market, and if it's still a big market, you've got something. Um, the bottom line here is keep validating until the results become consistent. You are going to hear some thumbs up, some thumbs down. Eventually, you know, use your knowledge of statistics. Get to the point where you pretty much know what you're going to hear, and don't stop until you do. Okay, and then when you are in front of investors and they say, how do you know this value proposition is gonna resonate? You can say, well, look, I've talked to 30 different physicians. I went to the ACC. I walked into this booth and this booth and this booth. I got it. And that's very impressive to people. Yes, up there. I have a question, but I think there's someone on my left question, right? Oh, okay. Right, okay. You. How do I read this? Uh, no, they, uh, they just have their hand up. Oh, okay. Um, can they speak? Uh, in the meantime, do you want to... Hi. Oh, okay, so my name is uh, Dr. Sina uh, Bonjour and hello. So my question is, I've been involved in clinical trials on a very, you know, deep basis, especially the last two years. So I've been doing trials in Paris, um, Quebec, uh, the States, Toronto, I've done a lot in Toronto, obviously. Mm -hmm. My question is, so let's say the device is a new device. How, I mean, and you said we have to kind of validate the, the trial results. Do we, or do I, as a person, um, as a lady and, and in business and in medicine, or trying to be at least, do I involve the investor? Um, let's say the investor is an acquaintance, I was at a conference, and I got to know, do I involve them? Um, I, know, I know per trial, I know there's, the, there's GCP, there's, um, you know, how we run the trial, but how far into the project do we involve in the trial? So let's say it's a phase one trial, I'm pretty confident 
that I could sell this uh, XYZ infrared device to do whatever. So do I do I incorporate the res results that are freshly new? Do I explain that the trials are going to go on? How soon do we evolve the investor? And the second question is, uh, how soon how soon do we touch base with the investor or the investee uh, and group of investors after we pitch? So just so I can have the algorithm of how you know how to incorporate the uh, the important investors. And thank you very much. Okay, so. The second question is, how fast do you get back to an investor after you've done your pitch? Yeah. And the answer is pretty quickly. Um, there are a lot of investors who will give you really good feedback, and there are some investors who will just ghost you. And that's kind of the way of the world. But, um, you know, a w within a week, you should call them, say, what did you think of my pitch? What was good? What was bad? Uh, ask for feedback. Uh, with regard to the first question, clinical trials, when do you include that information? The answer is as soon as you have it. A clinical trial is a validation. It is validating an assumption that you made. So if you made the assumption that, you know, we're going to have a sensitivity better than 70%, you do your clinical trial and the sensitivity comes back at 75%, well, you've got a win on your hands. And you can go back to the investor and you, and you can say, Here's the results of our trial. Um, you'll notice that the results are better than we had hoped. That's going to give the investor confidence that not only is your product good, but you know what you're doing. And the rest of your business case is also probably believable. So basically, when you get it, when you get, when you hit a milestone, when you get evidence, put it in your pitch right away. Okay, unless there's some compelling reason to keep things secret. Well, um, can I just add, it's not about, I, I, my, my real, um, my point was, what if the trial results aren't as good as we expected? I mean, I've seen a lot of antibiotics that are sellers, but then the trial results aren't that good, even though, it's, even though it's a really regulated and well done trial. Do we continue to pitch? We give them the truth, obviously. But, um, you know, then the, there comes the passion. We said, you know, we have to strive for the product we're selling. So that's, that's where it gets a bit ethical. So do I go forward with my antibiotics because the results were weren't that good that I have passion or do I hold back and just cancel the whole thing? Okay, so you need to be honest with yourself um, as well as being honest with your investors. If you have a clinical trial that fails um, to meet its primary outcome or whatever, um, do you have a plan B? You know, you can go to the investors and you can say, look, our clinical trial failed, we're gonna to pivot to this other compound or we're gonna do something else. Uh, obviously, you're not gonna put good money after bad. If the clinical trial fails and you have no compelling reason to think it's gonna work next time, then either it's time to abandon it or it's time to pivot to something else. Um, you know, this happens. The, the advice that you usually get is if you're gonna fail, fail early, right? Fail early before you've spent a huge amount of money and before you've invested a huge amount of your time, okay? It doesn't mean don't be persistent. Persistence is important. Um, it just means at some point you have to recognize reality. Um, most investors, I mean, I have been associated with companies that have failed clinical trials and have been able to pivot and became eventually successful. But it doesn't happen that often. Um, and, you know, if you have raised enough money to be able to pivot, then great, you're on your way, you can do something else. If you haven't raised enough money so if you've done your clinical trial and you're almost out of money and the clinical trial failed, likely your company is going to fail because people will not invest more money into a company that has a failed clinical trial, typically. Does that answer your question? Okay, we'll assume yes. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Okay. I think you've already answered. that 
and then how much uh, you can before you start building and move on to the next thing. Okay. If your validation is consistently negative, thank your lucky stars and do something else. Okay? And I really mean it because the worst thing that can happen is you're told this is great and then in the end it fails. And the first business I ever started, I was still working at the Wellesley Hospital at the time. I had this idea. I gathered 10 physicians together and bought them coffee. These were all friends of mine and I pitched and they all said, great, great, wonderful. And I went and started the business and it was mediocre. I got out, actually I broke even. I was really lucky to break even. Not a single one of those 10 doctors bought the thing I was selling. Okay, why? Because they were my friends. I was working with them. None of them wanted to give me bad news, okay? That was a huge mistake on my part, and I was lucky I got out with my shirt. But the point is, go to people you don't know, go to doctors, go to, go to uh, salespeople, go to distributors, talk to other CEOs, get the truth. And when you get the truth, sit down with yourself and say, is this worth doing? You know. There's always gonna be other opportunities. You gotta get the best one. It's not necessarily the one you start with. Okay, um, enough on this. Intellectual property. You have had lectures on intellectual property. You got a couple of quotes here that you can read at your leisure. I assume that they get this deck, do they? Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, intellectual property is incredibly important to startup companies. Now, people will give you the argument, why do we need patents? We can't afford to defend them. And this is absolutely true. Um, patents do absolutely nothing for small companies except chew up money. Because if somebody infringes on your patent, you can't call the police. You take them to court. And taking them to court costs more money than you have. The average patent infringement lawsuit costs $3 million in legal fees. Okay, so why do patents if you're a small company? The answer is what investors want is to invest their money, have you grow your company, sell the company so that they can make 10 times return on their money. Why do companies acquire other companies? They do it for their intellectual property. That's the primary thing that you're actually selling. Because big companies, they can defend patents all year long, right? And they can get these huge settlements and they will do that, but they're acquiring you for your IP. So your IP has to be part of your pitch, okay? And as it says here, you have to determine that your idea is patentable, that you have freedom to operate, and that you have ownership. Okay, and you've heard all this stuff before. How do you validate it? Well, for patentability, it's easy. You file a provisional patent. Okay, if you file a provisional patent with a decent patent lawyer, then the investors will say, oh, good patent lawyer, provisional patent. They must think there's something there. For freedom to operate, you can't afford to do a full freedom to operate search. They cost about $60,000 to do, but you can do a search yourself. So you can do a keyword search and you can search all the competitors. Do the searches. It's mind numbing work. It's horrible work. You got to do it. It takes days. Document it all. And then when the investor, potential investor asks you, how do you know you have freedom to operate? You can say, I've done keyword searches with these keywords. I've examined the patents. There were a couple of iffy ones. I discussed it with my patent lawyer. I did a search by competitor. You're telling them you did your job. You did your validation. They're going to want to say, okay, I want to hear more. Uh, ownership. Before you talk to investors, 
either get a license from the university or the hospital, if this came out of a university or a hospital, and get an assignment from all of the inventors on your patent. There are some people who try to avoid this by leaving other inventors off their patent. The problem is if somebody came along and said, hey, I, have a, I had a hand in that, it will invalidate your patent. So you gotta be, again, honest, get assignments from everybody, in return for those assignments, give them a little bit of equity in your company or whatever you have to do, but make sure that this is all settled before you go into due diligence, because that's a big hole that will really lower your valuation tremendously. Okay, next is financial return. You're talking to investors. They are gonna write you a check for a lot of money. They wanna know what their return is. So how much financing do you really need to hit your milestones? Um, how much money will you need in total to get to cash flow neutral and profitability? How long is it going to take? Remember that returns are based on time. Okay. Um, is there sufficient gross margin in your product? Is there, do you make enough mar, you know, are you making it for, for a hundred dollars and selling it for a hundred and ten dollars? That's not going to fly. Okay, in the medical device field, your, your goal is to get a 70% margin. Um, are there real comparables for an exit? So were there companies in your field that had exits? If you're in interventional cardiology, there are tons of them. Okay, but research it. Okay, bottom line, what IRR can you generate for your investors? If you have to ask what IRR is, your financial knowledge is not good enough. Okay, go get financing for dummies and read it. It stands for internal rate of return. Most venture capitalists at a minimum want a 30% IRR, okay, which is a lot. Okay, how do you validate financing and financial return? Best way is to look for comparable companies. Companies that were, that were startups, that are competitors, obviously not as good as what you have, um, but how much financing did they raise? What were the tranches? Um, how long did it take for them to get to market? Did they exit? What was the exit value? How much do the investors make? Okay, all this is available on the internet. One of the best site is a place called PitchBook. Um, it is uh, for members only either, and it's expensive, but you could find people who are members, talk to investors. Are you a member of PitchBook? Can you look this up for me? Um, there are others as well, uh, especially if they're public companies, all this information is available now. Um, look at comparable technologies. Again, how long did they take to develop? How long did they take to get to market? Maybe you can do it faster and you can say, I can do it faster because but in general, investors will look at that and say, if they did it in two years, it's really unlikely you're gonna do it in six months. Um, okay, you need to validate every number in your financial projections. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying if they did it in two years, it's less likely you're gonna do it in six months. Is, <clears throat> I was gonna say, is it possible that because other products in this area got validated, would it be, would it make it easier for your product to get validated faster? But that was just kind of my point. Yeah, you know, what, um, what the time so, you know, if other people did it, would it make it easier for, for you? Yeah. And the answer is maybe. Okay. So, you know, for example, if a product was a PMA and there have been four PMAs, it's now a 510K. So you can go faster, yeah. but you need a good reason. Yeah. Right? Um, if, you know, it took five years for this other product to be developed, but you're now using AI and you've got all this data. Talk to the investor. We can do it in six months because, yeah. and convince them. I see. Okay? Yeah. Like, uh, like for example, if now FDA has approved many AI enablements. Yes, they have. Like before. Yeah, the first one was ago, tough. It was a hard, very hard thing to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, other people have 
you know, plowed the field. That's good. Um, but you're still doing something that's brand new and innovative or you wouldn't be in this situation. Um, and you need to be convincing and you need to have some kind of, you know, validation that it's going to work. Okay. So anyway, bottom line, validate your financing and your financial return. Okay. And then there's ability to execute. So ability to, to execute means can you achieve the milestones that you say you're going to achieve? Do you have sufficient expertise and knowledge? Now, a lot of people with startups are first time CEOs. So how do you convince an investor that you're a good CEO when you've never done it before? Okay. Pretty hard to do. If you're an investor and you're approached by somebody who's, you know, right out of school and has started a company and you're approached by a second investor who says, I have started three companies and they all executed for $400 million. Who are you going to invest in? Okay. So how do you balance? How do you fight that? You fight that by, if you have no experience, surround yourself with people who do. Okay. This is really, really important. Surround yourself with people who have that experience who've run companies, who've had exits, find those people. How do you do that? Well, one of them is, is mentoring. So H2I, um, uh, the, the Creative Destruction Lab. U of T has 12 incubators, I think, right now. Um, get in with one of those, let them help you. Okay, do you have not only management expertise, but do you have the scientific and technical expertise? Do you have the development expertise? Do you have regulatory expertise, clinical trial expertise? You have to convince the investor that you have all the expertise that you need to get the job done. Now you don't have to have it in house. So regulatory, for example, you can say we have contracted with a regulatory consulting company. You know, they're ex FDA staffers and they know what they're doing and they tell me, I can get a 510k in nine months and they're going to help me. And I've contracted with somebody to get my quality system up and I've contracted with a, with a company that does clinical trials. You don't have to have them on staff, but you have to have those people. You have to have identified those people, have them available to you. Um, and you can even say, look, you know, for marketing, I have no marketing experience, but I know this guy, He's agreed he'll come and work for us if we get financing. And here's his resume. Um, okay, great. So it's dependent on financing, but at least you've identified the person and at least you know you can get the job done. Okay, can you execute? With, so how do you validate? As I said, surround yourself with people and suppliers and suppliers are a great source. You know, if you're if your product depends on a nitinol wire, well, you go to the best nitinol company you can and say, I'm developing this product. You sign a non-disclosure agreement with them and you say, give me a quote for helping me develop this product. And you take that to the investors. You're convincing the investors that you have, that you're going to take their money. You're going to spend it wisely and you're going to get the job done. Okay. How do you validate your regulatory plan? Well, a regulatory consultant is good. Even better is a pre-submission meeting with FDA. We went to FDA, we, we proposed a clinical trial, they agreed. We proposed a classification, class two or class three or whatever, they agreed. You're on the road, okay? You are saying to the investor, we know what we're doing, we're gonna get the job done from reg regulatory perspective. Okay. And if you're going to need a clinical trial for your product, before you go to investors, identify a PI, um, validate that that PI has the ability to recruit patients and, um, do all this before you talk to investors because you are facing huge competition. Okay. All this is because, you know, 
there is a lot of money available for investment in medical devices and medical products right now. But universities and hospitals and other companies are spinning out hundreds of companies a year. So yes, there's more money, but there's a lot more companies competing for that money. And that's why you have to be excellent at pitching in order to win these days, okay? It is actually a fairly tough environment out there right now. And so that's why we're going through this. Okay, last thing is assessing risk. When I am contracted to do a due diligence, my major job is assessing risk. Why is that my major job? Because I wouldn't be contracted unless the investor was already convinced that the value proposition was pretty good and that most of the stuff was pretty good. So I am contracted to assess risk. You should assess risk as part of your pitch. Yeah. Usually when you develop a medical device and something wrong happens with that patient, who's liable? Are you liable after selling your, your, your product to a hospital, for example? Or you? Well, you are going to get liability insurance, okay? And that's kind of um, like, you just, you have to. Um, if you didn't think of it, your investor will say, do you have product liability insurance? And it's not cheap. Depend it depends on the kind of product you have too. But um, yes, uh, you, if you have liability insurance, it should protect you to the point where if something goes wrong, you won't personally be affected. The company might go under, but you won't personally be affected other than that. Which usually the one hospital, they bought it. So. Yeah. If they are not liable, they bought it. When, 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 when there is a lawsuit for something that is medical device related or medical product related, everybody gets sued, okay? The nurses, the doctors, the medical device company, the hospital, everybody. You know, your mother-in-law, like everybody. Everybody gets sued. So, because... There was a very famous case once where it turned out that the fault was with one of the technicians and they had not been listed in the lawsuit. The lawsuit was dismissed. So now they sue everybody. So anyway, but you'll have insurance, you'll be fine. Okay, as I said, the primary function of due diligence is to assess risk. And the bottom line here is do the potential returns outweigh the residual risk. A residual risk is the risks that remain after you've mitigated the risk as far as you can. There's always going to be residual risk. Okay? In the case of this fellow walking on the tightrope, this fellow obviously knows there's risk because you can see the sharks under there. Right? And this fellow has mitigated this risk by getting this great big umbrella to help him keep his balance. Okay? So he's tried to reduce the risk as much as possible, but he knows there's still risk. He just needs to get to the other side more than he's worried about losing his life for some reason. Okay, here's all the risks. Okay, um, I'm not gonna read them all, but you can, you can go through them. These are the questions that you want to try and answer as far as you can. Okay, um, let's, take, uh, let's take IP risk. So you've already found out that, that you should be patentable. You filed a, uh, uh, a patent, um, but that doesn't mean that that patent will issue. So what are the chances that you're gonna get claims that are broad enough to act as a barrier to entry for competitors? Okay, it is a risk. It's a risk that you cannot completely uh, mitigate until you hear back from the patent office, which is not gonna be for a while. Um, so, you know, that's a question where, where if I was doing the due diligence, I'd go to another patent attorney and I'd say, give me your professional opinion on whether these claims will be accepted. Okay, so that's one of the risks. Um, 
Adoption risk. Is your pricing realistic? Will physicians change their workflow in order to use your device, etc., etc.? Okay, so read through all these. Also, there's a lot of validation. Um, as much as you can do here will help your pitch. It'll help your confidence level. It'll help your pitch. <clears throat> And in the end, it will also help your due diligence. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. So finally, pitch organization. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I had a question about the last one, which is exit, uh, exit risk, which, yeah. like, can you just explain what that means a bit more? Okay, so in order for venture capitalists to make money, they typically want to stay in investment about five years. And at the end of that five years, they are going to want the company to be sold for a huge multiple. Okay, so that's the aim. And one of the questions they're going to ask is, what's the likelihood that this company can be sold? Now, the answer to that question is, is a little bit complex. Why do companies buy other companies. You might think it's for the financial return. Hey, we're starting to sell a lot. We're a little bit profitable. We made a million dollars last year in profit. To Medtronic or Boston Scientific or any of the other big guys, that's lunch money, right? They don't care about your financial return. What do they care about? They care that your product is synergistic with their product. In other words, that your product will help them sell more of their product. Okay, so if you have a product that helps Medtronic sell more pacemakers, they're gonna buy you, okay? But there are a number of products where there's nothing synergistic about it. They're kind of standalone. Or where there's no big companies that have the kind of resources it takes to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for a company. So, I mean, you won't find that in, in invasive cardiology. There's tons of companies who can buy you. But in other things, you know, if you, if you have a product that's a great product in rehab, well, there aren't a lot of big products and uh, big companies in rehab that can spend $100 million acquiring something, and there aren't a lot of things that work together. So that's exit risk, okay? What is the risk that there won't be a company around that wants you, even if you're doing well? Okay, um, pitch organization. Pitch organization depends a lot on the product and is very individual, okay? You can look up on the internet pitch organization and it'll kind of give you a formula that doesn't work for everybody. So think creatively. Uh, one of the things I like in, when I hear a pitch is to hear a story at the beginning. There was this patient and this patient, you know, went through this agony and it doesn't have to happen. Okay, why do you tell a story? Because humans are oriented towards stories a lot more than they're oriented towards facts. Okay, and you want to get their attention right away. And if it's something personal, if you got into this particular field because your aunt or uncle died of something and you want, you know, that's a combination of a story and passion and reason and it resonates. Investors are human and it, it resonates with them. Um, what's your solution? Why is it different? Why is it better? You know all this stuff. Uh, why will people pay for it? Okay, really, really important. Um, you know, and again, getting back to reimbursement. If it's not reimbursed properly, it's very unlikely people are going to pay for it. What's going to be involved in getting to reimbursement? You know, you've got to get into the medical guidelines. You've got to publish papers. How long is that going to take you before you can get reimbursement? It's usually years. Um, so, you know, you're going to sell to early adopters in the early phases because it's good for patients. But at some point, you've got to have some validation that you'll be able to get reimbursement for this because, you know, this other technology, which is similar, got reimbursement and it took them 18 months. And so we're going to do it in 18 months. Um, those kind of arguments, okay, are what's going to sell your pitch. Obviously, the market, 
your management and KOL teams. Um, and when I say a KOL team, I haven't talked about this before, but again, if you haven't done this before and you want to convince people that you have the ability to execute, try and form a medical advisory board or a scientific advisory board. Get some KOLs on that board who are advising you. Most investors in our field have specialized in medical devices or medical products. They know these KOLs. They're going to call them up and say, oh, I see you're on this board. What do you think of this new device? Okay. Um, talk about development, regulatory, clinical pathway. Um, describe your validation activities. Talk about your IP. Lay out your sales and marketing plan. Okay. Um, I was dealing with a, with a startup from the CDL um, last week and we went through everything and they have no sales and marketing plan. I mean, nothing real. And I said, you gotta have a sales and marketing plan. Um, how do I get it? I said, look, you have enough money right now. Go out and interview five potential sales managers and ask each one of them, how would you sell my product? See what they say. Eventually, you're going to hire the best one. Okay? And you can say to them, look, I can't hire you till I get investment, but I need to know about sales. I said, maybe they'll even ask you for some money to come up with a plan, but get one. Get one. And at the same time, then you have a name of somebody you're going to hire once you get your, your investment. Um, lay out your sales and marketing plan. Show a roadmap. Try and show it visually. Um, and then go through your financial projections. All your financial projections have to be in a pitch. Is yearly sales time to break even and positive EBITDA? Time to positive EBITDA. That's all you need. Okay, you don't need to have these big spreadsheets with you know, every single line of what you're going to pay for everything. That comes in due diligence. Okay, they just want the general overall picture. Again, Remember that you are not trying to get somebody to write a check as a, as, as a result of your pitch. You're trying to get somebody to go into due diligence. Okay, and they may ask you questions. And again, what you wanna have is that financial information at your fingertips. You know, if they say, how did you come up with your yearly sales in year two? You know, you say, well, you know, I talked to uh, this guy at Medtronic and he showed me his curve for adoption of their product. Uh, I cut that in half because they're much bigger than us. Um, and at least you have something to come back with. Okay. Okay. So in summary, pitching to investors is very hard work. Okay. Especially the validation part. Very hard work. Um, to make it easier, find the right investors to pitch to, okay? You can pitch to the wrong investors at first in order to get feedback and, and practice, but eventually find the right investors. There's a lot of different companies out there. Find something that, you know, someone that, that uh, some company that is aligned to you, okay? You need both style and substance. Again, if you are not a good speaker, get a coach, become a good speaker. It's vital. Um, think and talk money. Refine every aspect of your business case. Validate, validate, validate. Okay, and that's all I've got. Thank you.